Let's continue. Our hero's illness gives way to chapter six, the famous book burning episode. The major irony here involves the hesitations that our would-be inquisitors display during their fairly arbitrary condemnation of textual heretics. The priest, the licentiate Pedro Perez, and the barber, Nicolás, consider whether or not the more than 100 leather-bound bodies of text merit punishment by fire. The narrator's sarcasm reaches a crescendo when he describes the housekeeper and niece's bloodlust, the urgent desire that both of them had for the death of those innocent victims. Then come the disagreements between the judges. For example, the priest wants to burn the Amadis of Gao, noting that since it is the promoter of the dogma of such a dangerous sect, we must, without any excuses, condemn it to the flames. But the barber objects, and so it is granted life for now. But they wax authoritarian again, sending numerous books to the fire. We witness another touch of religious fanaticism when the priest declares that he'll burn along with them the very father who begot me. By the way, where's the fire located? In the corral. There was water in the last corral, right? The episode soon discloses the respect that Cervantes had for Mateo Boyardo and Ludovico Ariosto, earlier authors of the best burlesques of chivalric romance. In a conciliatory moment, the priest says that if he finds books by these authors, he will not burn them. He even notes that Ariosto reads best in Italian, which has led to speculation that Cervantes read Italian. This would not have been unusual. He could have learned Tuscan while at Rome and Naples between 1569 and 1574. This honorific burst accentuates the privileged status that Italy will have throughout Cervantes' novel, especially at the heart of the Sierra Morena episodes. The inquisitorial process continues at random, which seems to be the basis of Cervantes' main complaint against that institution. At the same time, he uses the episode as a kind of literary review. He pardons the Amadis, Palmerina of England, and Tirant Lo Blanc, as well as Montemayor's Diana, some collections of lyric poetry, and then a series of major epics, La Auracana by Ercilla, La Austriada by Rufo, and El Monserrato by Birues. This allows us to glimpse into Cervantes' literary preferences and might be useful for interpreting the novel we are reading. What do they have in common? It's dangerous to generalize, but I will anyway. Emotion, love in particular, and always contrasted against anger, and certainly nothing of national chauvinism, but rather tremendous anxiety and doubt about the imperialist expansion of late 16th century Spain. Montemayor and Ercilla are perhaps the best examples here of a certain reformist mindset. La Diana is a maze of love stories that ends in a Moorish novel, signaling a desire for transcultural reconciliation. La Auracana is an anti-epic, emphasizing the heroism of the indigenous Americans and portraying their Spanish conquerors as corrupt and immoral. Finally, we cannot avoid the wild reference to La Galatea, a pastoral novel written by Cervantes himself. Don Quixote is a fiction that focuses on fiction as one of its main topics, and this will not be the last time that our author will incorporate himself into his own text with dazzling effect. Let's review. Notice how the inquisitorial fire is lit just as Don Quixote comes home, all thrashed, molido in Spanish, and beaten, imagining himself to be a Moorish protagonist in a frontier ballad. This establishes a rather complex relationship between the hero and that most infamous of Spanish institutions. Has Don Quixote exceeded his mandate, thus deserving to be condemned to burn in hell like his books? Or is it, rather, that our hero's absence unleashes the vengeful, barbaric impulses of his fellow citizens? Or could it be that the fiery destruction of a library is the author's own way of projecting a kind of personal nightmare? In which case, we have to ask, which author? If we accept the fictional hypothesis that there is an original author, that what we are reading has been copied from the annals of La Mancha, then it should be interesting that said author tends to burn books that have relatively little to do with cultural frontiers. And it is hard not to be moved by the randomness of the burning of heretics. Tyrant Leblanc, for example, only escapes the flames because it happens to fall at the feet of the barber, and even Cervantes' own La Galatea is in a predicament. The priest denies it mercy, setting it aside in a kind of limbo, just in case the author manages to improve its second part. 
This passage will always be considered one of Cervantes' most impressive achievements to have mocked and even laughed at the Inquisition. At the same time, he leaves us with a tragic irony in the final moments of literature's most famous auto de fe. The priest grew tired at the prospect of looking at more books, and so without a further thought, he wanted to burn all the rest. But the barber already held one called The Tears of Angelica open in his hands. I would shed them myself, he said when he heard the name, if I had ordered the burning of such a book. What if all of these books were people? Another horrific irony, the last book to be spared is a Spanish continuation of the love between Angelica and Medoro the Moor, the relationship that drove Roland mad in Ariosto's Orlando Furioso, the crisis of national identity again. And then we find out from the priest that the author of The Tears of Angelica also translated into Spanish some fables by Ovid. Perhaps there is still hope for a cultural metamorphosis here. Finally, let us admit that not only did Cervantes invent the art of the modern novel, he also invented the art of literary criticism.